Services Committee to order. Um, it's Thursday, January 26th, 2023, and we do not have a quorum at present, but we are um, not taking up the bill until later, um, later on this hearing. So first we'll begin with presentations, and our first presentation is from Minsher, and um, Nate Clark is here to present, um, and please introduce yourself. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, begin your presentation. Uh, good morning, Chair Wickland, members of the committee, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. My name is Nate Clark, and I am the CEO of Minsher. Um, we've prepared a few slides to go along with our remarks today. I'm here to discuss three items that are included in Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's one Minnesota budget recommendations. The first proposal I'd like to talk about is Minsher's IT modernization proposal, which was included in the, the governor's supplemental budget recommendation last year, and which might be familiar to the committee. I'll also talk about a new proposal which will establish health insurance easy enrollment program in the state of Minnesota. And finally, I'll give an overview of the proposal to expand public awareness efforts of the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program. I'll begin with an overview of the IT modernization proposal, which will upgrade and replace the core technology that supports Minsure. This proposal improves the experience for Minnesotans who use the technology to apply for, enroll, and maintain their enrollments in a qualified health plan, or a QHP, through Minsure. The proposal also improves the systems and tools that caseworkers use to manage enrollee information. Before I get into the details of the proposal, I'll start with some quick background for the committee. As you know, Minsure was established in 2013 to ensure that all Minnesotans have the security of health care. Our goal has been to promote consumer choice, to reduce health disparities, simplify the process of enrolling in a qualified health program, and facilitate transitions in coverage for those Minnesotans who move between a QHP and a state public health program. Minsure is a one-stop shop for private health insurance and public, public programs. Minnesota, Minnesotans looking for access to access a private plan on the individual market or Minnesota Care or Minnesota Medical Assistance can come to Minsure.org and fill out an online application that determines their eligibility for those coverage options. The application and eligibility technology platform used by Minsure was launched in 2013 and is shared by our partners at the Department of Human Services and the counties. The platform is referred to as the Minnesota Eligibility Technology System, or METS, and since its launch in 2013, Minsure has worked with our agency partners to upgrade the platform and improve service delivery for Minnesotans. In addition to shared maintenance and upkeep of the METS platform, Minsure has also made strategic investments that improve the consumer experience for Minnesotans who apply for qualified health plans. This work has paid dividends. For several years now, we've seen an increase in signups, with hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans coming to Minsure to enroll in comprehensive health coverage and to access the federal advanced premium tax credits that reduce the cost of their monthly premiums. Our recent efforts include a 2019 project to replace the legacy plan shopping and enrollment technology system. In addition to streamlining, streamlining and simplifying the consumer experience, the new technology enabled Minsure to better manage and report consumer enrollment information and to interface with insurance carriers and federal systems. As a result of the investment, we've seen substantial improvements to Minsure operations and significant service improvements for our consumers. The value of the 2019 technology investment became more evident when Minsure was able to leverage the new technology platform to rapidly implement program changes mandated by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ensuring that Minnesotans could access the enhanced tax credits available as quickly as possible. However, structural limitations in the underlying application and customer management technology continue to hamper our efforts to further improve service delivery and to reach more uninsured and underinsured Minnesotans. Minsure has responded to these limitations with manual work processes and higher staffing levels and through frequent costly updates to the IT platform. These improvements are incremental, however, and don't address the constraints that prevent us from offering Minnesotans the service experience that they want and need. 
The governor's recommendation recognizes that upgrading the legacy IT platform is necessary to provide in a streamlined, simple, and more efficient application and enrollment experience that, e that is easy to use and that removes barriers that make it difficult for Minnesotans to access and maintain health insurance coverage. The proposal will make it possible for MNsure to reach more Minnesotans who need us the most, those who continue to remain uninsured or underinsured. It will also improve service delivery and create a better consumer experience. It will become a more agile and efficient agency and also establish a solid technological foundation that will bring our systems and service experience up to date and prepare us for the future. So what exactly does this proposal deliver? And here I'm looking at slide five. It preserves the no wrong door approach um, to applying for health insurance so Minnesotans will continue to come to Minsure to access health coverage as they do today. It in introduces consumer self-service capabilities so enrollees can do things like access their account information and report changes without having to call Minsure, call the Minsure Contact Center. It improves access for limited English proficient Minnesotans by providing an application and enrollment experience in multiple languages, including notices and other customer notifications. It introduces a new assister portal and it improves service capabilities for the navigators and brokers who help Minnesotans apply and enroll in coverage through Minsure. It upgrades the systems that caseworkers use to access, maintain, and update customer accounts. The upgraded IT platform will have lower maintenance and operations costs, will be easier and less expensive to modify and upgrade, and will have the flexibility to support future federal state health care regulatory changes and policy innovation. And finally, it will help generate a more sustainable operation for Minsure, including permanent and annual projected savings to our budget of over $4 million beginning in fiscal 2026 and reductions of thousands of hours in staff and consumer time spent on manual processes and calls to the insurance contact center. The next slide provides a high-level overview of the fiscal request to implement the proposal. Costs for the proposal include minute costs to, de to decommission QHP programs from the legacy system, funds to license the replacement application, eligibility assister, and other technology from an outside vendor, one year of maintenance and operations costs as we transition to a fully operational system, and funds for the Department of Human Services for temporary staffing during the transition, and also costs for maintaining METs. The total cost is about $30.46 million over four years. Finally, I'd like to note that over the last several years, Minsure has heard from and engaged with stakeholders on many of the issues the modernization proposal is designed to address. The proposal will greatly improve the experience for Minnesotans we serve, and we look forward to continuing that work with our stakeholder partners in the coming months, many of whom we know are looking forward to the system's upgrades and features a modern IT platform can provide. The second item we're presenting on today is the governor and lieutenant governor's recommendation to establish an easy enrollment program. Minnesota has long been a leader in health care policies and programs that expand access to health insurance coverage. Minnesota consistently ranks among the top states for low rates of uninsurance, and according to the Minnesota Department of Health, the uninsurance rate in Minnesota in 2021 was a record low of 4%, the lowest that the survey has recorded. However, 4% still means hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans continue to lack the security and the peace of mind of affordable health insurance coverage, and uninsurance rates remain stubbornly high for communities of color and for Minnesota's indigenous communities. This is unacceptable. At the same time, we know that as many as three in four Minnesotans who are uninsured may be eligible based on their income for programs that would make their health insurance more affordable. This includes medical assistance, Minnesota care, and the federal advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions that are available on private insurance plans that are sold through the Minsure Exchange. This suggests that many uninsured, uninsured Minnesotans aren't aware of the options that are available to them, don't have time to look, or simply don't know where to start. While Minsure manages ongoing statewide public awareness campaigns designed to reach Minnesotans who need affordable health insurance, and also while our statewide network of certified navigators and brokers undertake their own outreach efforts, these outreach methods are oftentimes generalized public awareness communications campaigns that are designed to reach a broad audience. A more targeted approach would amplify these efforts and allow Minsure to directly reach Minnesotans who have self-identified as in need of information about health insurance options. 
And that's why Lieutenant, the Governor and Lieutenant Governor recommend establishing an easy enrollment program in Minnesota. An easy enrollment program provides a convenient, voluntary opportunity for Minnesotans to request information about health insurance coverage options and to receive a personalized response to help them access comprehensive, affordable coverage. The program works through a partnership between MNSURE, the Minnesota Department of Revenue, and the Department of Human Services. In so doing, it leverages existing touch points between residents and their state government. Minnesotans who file state income taxes would see a box on the tax form that they can check to indicate that they or a member of their tax household are currently without health insurance. Checking the box authorizes the Department of Revenue to share information with MNSURE. The department would share the information that is needed in order to complete um, a preliminary eligibility determination, things like the adjusted gross income, the tax household side, and the taxpayer address. Minsher would then complete the preliminary determination for the household, send a letter indicating what benefits may be available, may be el they may el be eligible to receive, as well as information on application and enrollment assistance that they can connect with for free um, assistance in actually applying for those programs. After completing the application, households that qualify for private coverage through Minsher would qualify for a special enrollment period that permits the household to enroll if, the outs, if they are outside the open enrollment period. Minnesotans who qualify for medical assistance or Minnesota care are already able to enroll at any time during the year once they're determined eligible for one of these programs and these individuals or these households would, be, would, would continue enrolling using the normal process that, administered, that is administered by DHS and the counties. An easy enrollment program would benefit Minnesotans by giving more children and families access to affordable health insurance increasing their ability to seek medical care when it is needed, and reducing the risk of medical debt that comes from being uninsured. The program requires an investment of $453,000 in the first fiscal year, and then $468,000 in the following years. This funding would support the Department of Revenue to make tax form and instruction changes, and to create a secure database for data transfers, for staff, it would have recover staffing for receiving data and processing eligibility determinations and handling increased calls to Minsure's contact center, as well as sending notices to participating households. And finally, it would, it would provide funds for DHS to process the final eligibility determinations for these consumers and also to support them as they enroll in programs. Our third proposal, which is included in the governor's budget, includes an $800,000 investment to increase public awareness for the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program. According to the Minnesota Department of Health, close to 400,000 Minnesotans have been diagnosed with diabetes, and for many who use insulin to manage their diabetes, costs for these prescriptions can sometimes exceed hundreds of dollars per month or more. The Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program was launched in July 2020 to help Minnesotans who struggle to afford their insulin. The program is a partnership between Minsure and the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy. Since launching in 2020, the program has helped approximately 1,640 Minnesotans access over $9 million worth of insulin. In addition to providing training for Minsure navigators who assist Minnesotans applying for the program, Minsure is responsible for creating public awareness campaigns for the program. To support those public awareness efforts, the legislature approach appropriated $250,000 in one-time funding from the Health Care Access Fund to launch a public awareness campaign, and that was in 2020. This funding has been critical for raising awareness of Minnesota's nation-leading insulin affordability program. However, the initial appropriation was time-limited through 2024 and less than what is typically uh, allocated for a high-impact statewide marketing effort. This, is, this has meant that Minsure is, has had to be strategic and measured and in order to stretch available dollars over time. Fortunately, these efforts were temporarily aided by significant earned media around passage of the new law, but that initial rise in media attention has since passed. Minsure has used the appropriation to create an online public awareness campaign that leverages social media ads and paid online ads. And while the campaign has generated some awareness among Minnesota's diabetic populations, the campaign relies heavily on leveraging existing social media networks and also on word of mouth. We know there are more people out there who could use the program, they just need to know about it. 
To better raise awareness, the Governor and Lieutenant Governor recommend a one-time investment of $800,000 from the Health Care Access Fund for Mincher to continue operating the public awareness campaign for the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program and also to increase the reach of the campaign. The proposal would allow Mincher to introduce new ways of reaching a broader base of Minnesotans, including public awareness announcements in print, on television, radio, on, on out-of-home ads, things like billboards or signs at transit stations. An investment in public awareness for the program means more Minnesotans across the state will have access to, to life-saving insulin. Importantly, the Department of Health has reported that Minnesota's black, Latino, indigenous, and Asian communities experience higher rates of type 2 diabetes. Additional funding will help Mincher better target our outreach efforts and communities who are at higher risk. Based on our experience managing Mincher statewide marketing campaigns and on our current efforts managing public awareness for the insulin program, we're able to estimate that an investment of $800,000 could mean more information about the program would be seen and heard millions more times than it is today. For example, the current monthly budget of $2,500 averages a reach of about 380,000 views and 2,600 clicks that direct individuals to the Min Insulin Org website. By increasing the monthly budget by just $3,000, the program could increase ad views over 700,000 and clicks to the website by 200 to 300 per month. And while the budget does not allow for television or radio ads, we estimate that a one-time $200,000 television ad could buy a television ad buy could be viewed up to 50 million times over several weeks, and an $80,000 radio ad buy could be heard up to 25 million times. This one-time investment of $800,000 from the Health Care Access Fund will allow Mincher to continue operating the public awareness campaign for the Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program while greatly increasing the reach of the campaign. A small portion of the investment will fund the Mincher FTE who oversees and manages the public awareness campaign over those three fiscal years. The Minnesota Insulin Safety Net Program has been a critical resource for Minnesotans across the state who need help accessing affordable insul insulin. Mincher is proud of our role in the program and we hope the legislature will help us increase our efforts to reach as many Minnesotans as possible. Uh, that concludes our interview of the proposals that are included in the Governor and Lieutenant Governor's budget. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and I, as always, you're welcome to reach out to um, Mincher if you have additional inf requests or you need more information that we, that we don't cover today. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, appreciate the presentation. Members, any, have any questions? Um, Senator Abler? Well, thanks. Good morning, Mincher. I, uh, Good morning. I've uh, been part of this discussion for a long time, and uh, I won't even go into the history of it, but it's been very interesting. And are you uh, still charged? Is it three and a half percent that we're tacking on? And so yeah. you're at the max on that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Clark? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Abler. Yes, we, it's, uh, the, the fee that we charge, the premium withhold, is 3.5 percent. All right. Madam Chair, I got a, I have a few questions. So. Um, and so uh, what, what's the current budget for the Mincher operation, Mr. Clark? Mr. Clark? Uh, our expense budget is about $38 million. All right. Is Madam Chair, because uh, when we were, this was going to be a 2% thing, and you're never going to need the 3 and a half if you, you were not around then. So and this is even against you. It's like, so um, some of these programs don't operate as you hope, and at least you're, it's the operating is smoothly, and there's just been quite a history, which you could look back at. Uh, a lot of news articles, and I'm glad it's working smoothly. And I think you have 110,000 enrollees now, or something like that. Um, and I'm just, you know, there's a lot of, you know, good ideas in these proposals, and the insulin thing makes sense. And I've been a part of that discussion, trying to help people get insulin. Um, but I'm, I, I hope as we consider all these different ideas that have been brought to us, uh, many of which are brought because there's this you know, buckets of money lying around, um, that we try to find a way to make sure, if we acted as though there wasn't much money lying around, would we still do it that way? Um, and so as I just did some quick math, I divided 30 million by 110,000. That's $270 um, per enrollee for this, you know, good idea. Um, I would personally prefer that you handle all this stuff out of your budget. And 3.5% is a lot. And it's not a small matter for 
the state to pay their share and the people to pay that. And, um, on the diabetes thing, um, are there really people who don't know that they can get these, these meds? When we were doing our work with the insulin groups, there was like a network and they all talked to each other. They're on Facebook saying, do you have a little, do you have one of these, pen, you know, do you have some of this? Oh, I got some extra and, and all of that. And so um, <clears throat> I'm just curious, do you know there's really a need for people who, it seems like diabetics uh, who need insulin have a relationship with a clinic who could easily tell them whatever is available and they're pretty good about that. So thank you, could, could, I'd like your thoughts on that. Uh, Mr. Clark. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Eibler, for the questions. Um, I guess a number of responses. Thanks for acknowledging that the, that the operations of the exchange have improved significantly over the last few years um, in terms of scope and sort of the cost per member for this investment. I guess I would look at it a little bit differently. Um, I would also factor in that, you know, in, since 2015 when I joined the exchange, Mincher has helped almost 850,000 or 895,000 Minnesotans come to the exchange and apply for coverage. Um, so I think that's a significant benefit. Mincher is actually part of sort of the health delivery infrastructure at this point in the state of Minnesota. And what we're providing Minnesotans is not the kind of service experience that they, I think, want and deserve. And so what I think the investment is doing is addressing structural limitations that are keeping us from reaching our full potential as an organization. We've made a minimal investment um, a few years back. So we've seen significant returns on that investment. What we know is that the investment we're recommending in this budget is something that will help us actually Levels, it'll, it'll help bring us to a new level of performance and also be able to engage um, with Minnesotans and to help them. Um, with respect to the insulin program and whether or not um, folks do or don't know, um, it's, I, I'm not in a position to say. What I do know is that advertising drives engagement. Engagement drives folks to our website. We see connections between that all the time. And from that, I can only infer that as we make investments that are thoughtful, that are deliberate, that are directed, um, that these will actually produce results that will help Minnesotans. So, so we feel confident from what we have seen that this is good and that it actually would, would produce results. Thanks. And, and Madam Chair. Um, just, Senator Abler. And I appreciate it. I'm not going to belabor this, but I, you know, I, um, <laughs> it's been a long discussion. It's been a long history. I was in, from the very beginning, I was on the conference committee. And, and so I just had a long history, and I'm just trying to avoid getting too far into that part of my head. But uh, Madam Chair, is, uh, as you lead the committee and, and bring forward the recommendations that you're going to deem to be the most important, I, I hope that just the availability of all this money doesn't color our, 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 our carefulness with spending the money and what we're going to be imposing on future liabilities or even one-time ones. Uh, like today, we're going to do a food shelf thing. I think that's... I'm going to vote for that. I think that's, that's certainly on the essential thing. People have to have food. There's essential, important, and nice, which is what the triage I used in 2011 when we had a $6 billion deficit. And it was horrible having to go through that. So as we go forward into setting up programs, if we can, like, for sure take care of, essential is in the eye of the boulder, but at least if we're like, well, yeah, that's, that's something we really have to do. And some of these other programs, um, I don't know, can you lean up your budget, can you, so I'm just, so I'm, maybe it's important uh, to do this, but just as you judge that, Madam Chair, that's my encouragement to you and to the committee, so thank you, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, Senator Abler, I, I mean, I think when I think about importance, I think we probably do have some shared areas that we, you know, have a similar idea of what important is and essential and um, I think that there are some things that we haven't been able to do that are really important and could um, be uh, leveraged to making bigger differences in people's health outcomes. And so some of those things might be, might be new, they might be existing that we want to enhance. But yes, we, we have to consider, um, you know, what is an effective use of the money. And, and I think I, I have a good idea about that too. Yeah, so. I, and I, I know you do, Senator Madam Chair. Sure. Just, and is, so is there, I just am looking at your thing here, but I presume there's a level of detail of the, the 30 million and the 800 and the, all those other parts which you could, are they in the book? The detail of it, like what's 1 million for here and 2 million for this? Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh, is, the, is the detail of your proposal like how you're, 
one of the histories that the only amendment I got adopted um, in the conference committee was amendment number 399, which tells you how robust the dialogue was. And that's that you have to submit a budget. The first budget that we got for whatever, 30 million or something, was a single piece of paper with like $10 million for this and 15 million for that. And it's like, really? Well, he says you have to give us a budget. And so I should have been more specific. It should have been a detailed budget. So I'm just, is there a detailed, like how are you gonna spend every penny and what you're gonna outsource to vendors? Is there a proposal like that? Is that in the book? I didn't, I just got the book this morning. Mr. Sure. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Ebler. Um, I don't actually know what's in your book. I do know we have a great deal of detail about the proposal. This is actually a proposal that you probably recall from prior sessions because we discussed it before this committee or with members of the committee last year. Um, so over th that's given us plenty of time to build out um, a strong understanding of what we'll require to decommission QHP programs from METS, what we will need to license technology from a new vendor, what we expect ongoing support costs to be, but also at the same time, what we expect the savings will be as a result. And so, yeah. I mean, we'd be happy to meet with you and take you through that if that would be helpful. Well, sure, and, and I'm done, Madam Chair. But yeah, if you could provide at least get that to the, I think the committee members might be interested in that as well. So um, if you could just get that to me and perhaps the committee. Thank you. Senator Ebler, I, I believe that is in the books that we have. And um, if, it, if it isn't, we please let us know if the information isn't there that you're looking for. I just had one question about um, the easy enrollment proposal. Um, is that something that you've seen other states have done something similar, or I think I've read that other states, some of them have a, a box you can check to actually enroll, but um, have you looked into this um, based on what other states have been doing? Do you have any information on that? Yeah. Mr. Clark? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we actually have, so we, we're aware of a couple of other states. We looked specifically at Maryland and also at Massachusetts. Um, Maryland has a similar state population to what we have in Minnesota. And so we use, and also a similar uninsured rate as we do in Minnesota. And so we use that really as a model for trying to understand what the program would need to look like, what kind of uptake we would expect and those kinds of things. Um, based on the analysis that we did of Maryland's results, we would expect that as many as 60,000 households, tax households would actually check the box. And that would be a great opportunity for uh, Minsure and DHS to follow up with those households and make sure that those who were interested have the information they need to enroll. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, member? Okay. Well, thank you very much for presenting and look forward to more discussion about the proposals as we go forward. So thank you for your time thank today. Thank you so much. And members, I do want to indicate we do have a quorum present. And now we will move to the governor's budget presentation from the Department of Health. And actually, while, while we're getting the technology set up, I, I also want to indicate um, Senator Bolden is participating remotely today and has been part of the um, meeting since the beginning of the <coughs> meeting. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner Cunningham, and um, look forward to hearing uh, about the, the proposed budget. Please proceed, uh, introduce yourself, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be in front of you all today to present the governor's budget for MDH. I'm joined with our deputy commissioner from MDH, Margaret Kelly. I'll walk you through several slides, and then we'll take time for questions at the end, if that's okay with you, Chair sure. Wicklin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also joined from many other members of the team at MDH to help uh, answer those questions. So this is an exciting uh, budget for us this year. As you all recall from the overview that I gave at MDH, our mission is to protect, maintain, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. 
And our goal in this budget package is to really address seven key areas, and we'll walk through these buckets in more detail uh, one by one, but let me just list them out for you here today. Um, strengthening public health and preparedness, reducing disparities and addressing health equity, um, time critical prevention uh, strategies to address emerging or worsening health threats, um, a healthy start for our youngest Minnesotans, healthcare access, affordability, and quality, addressing current service needs and federal compliance, and maintaining safe and healthy drinking water. So starting with the uh, strengthening public health and preparedness package, our goal is that, again, all Minnesotans have the same basic public health protections, and the whole system is better prepared to respond to public health crises. We need a deeper investment in our public health system infrastructure and transformation. As you all may recall from our overview, um, the public health system is not just MDH, but it's local public health partners, it's tribal health, um, it's, it's partnerships with community-based organizations, as well as with healthcare systems. And this money really funds, focuses on both MDH, our LPH, our local public health partners, and our tribal public health, and many of the uh, foundational areas of public health, which again, those are controlling communicable diseases or infectious disease, um, prevention strategies around chronic disease and injury prevention, environmental health, and again, uh, addressing those gaps in access uh, to care. So. Uh, the, the package that you see there and on page 158 is about really um, bolstering the public health system across those partners. We have another proposal um, to really focus on emergency response. Um, emergency response is critical. We, we understand that from the COVID pandemic um, and as I mentioned before in our overview, um, in public health, we often go from panic to neglect, and so um, this really will provide the staffing, the training, the supplies, the call center um, to maintain our, our basic foundational level of an emergency response for the, for the state. We have uh, two important offices to really address disparities um, by Minnesotans most impacted by, by health disparities. Clearly, you all are aware of the statistics. You all are aware that, you know, if, if there's any statistic around health outcomes, often who we see at the, with the worst outcomes are our, our American Indian populations and our African American populations in the state. Now, the Office of American Indian Health was started through a CDC health equity grant. Um, that office has really been focusing on tribal public health infrastructure, but that grant funding ends. And in addition to focusing on tribal health, public health infrastructure, given the health status of American Indians in the state, uh, we need some sustained and directed investment um, in, in, in their health. Similarly with our African Minnesotans who identify as African American. And so these offices will really um, be a mechanism for us to involve community more robustly. The Office of African American Health will include a new council. There will be grants that are agnostic to disease, so sort of focusing on those upstream root causes of disease, which I talked again a lot about in our, in our overview, um, thinking about how we can support the state in sort of policy analysis and creating thinking about the pipeline. We talk a lot about the pipeline into uh, public health and to the caring professions. We have heard a lot about from community and I know from my own experience, emergent experiences were particularly important in me imagining my own future. And so we want to create some experiences for our students from secondary education or community college backgrounds. We also know that an important area to go deeper is around uh, Minnesotans living with disabilities. Um, we, this proposal is a recognition of the importance of a larger focus on Minnesotans who are living with disabilities. P 
people with disabilities often, often have challenges in terms of access to care, in terms of facing discrimination when they're in the care system, in terms of getting attention paid to their preventative health issues to their chronic disease needs, um, not to mention the environments and sort of uh, the built environment in which care is delivered, as well as data. Um, um, we know that uh, people living with disabilities have been clamoring and waiting and uh, for them to see themselves in data, and this will give us some funding to really uh, devote more time and resources to really building out that uh, data infrastructure. We also know in terms of addressing uh, disparities and uh, dealing head on where suffering and costs fall the hardest, community health workers have been a really important and evidence-based strategy to reach those who are hardest hit. And so this proposal will help us to evaluate um, the community health worker workforce and to invest in that workforce um, as they are vital advocates for health. Again, thinking about the importance of partner partnering um, well and in a mutually beneficial way with communities, we have uh, two other proposals on this slide. Uh, the top proposal really focuses on uh, providing grants to community-based organizations to improve some of their capacity uh, to be strong partners with us as an agency. We really believe that communities have a lot of the solutions, um, but many community-based organizations are small, uh, may not have the same resources or experience working with the state. Yeah, of course, there's a wide distribution, um, but these grants in terms of building capacity will be to sort of invest in those organizations as they develop uh, the solutions. Um, with us. The bottom um, proposal on this slide is really more about MDH itself and how we work, right? So uh, if you think about the top proposal as investing in the community-based organizations for a mutually beneficial partnership, the bottom proposal is more about investing in MDH so that we really uh, build out the best practices for community engagement and disseminate those uh, within, our, within our staff, both at MDH and again, local public health, which is a, a, key, a key partner. Uh, moving on to the next proposal, the Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council, or the HEAL Council, uh, which um, does currently exist at MDH. Um, this council uh, is similar to other councils that we might see at the Department of Human Services, um, a means, again, to get um, feedback into our work from communities most impacted by uh, health inequities. We have seen these councils to have a lot of success. Um, however, the HEAL Council, un unlike um, some of the other councils and state agencies, is not in statute, and we would like to put it in statute because of the importance um, of, the, of that work and that input. Um, Next, we have the all-payer claims database. Um, we, we talk a lot about, um, and I, as a past researcher, and, and you all as policymakers, uh, rely on evidence, and we know the importance of evidence to, to policy making. Um, and sometimes when you start using a, a resource, you find out some of the limitations of, of that data and that evidence. And so really, we are proposing some enhancements to the all-payer claims database um, to, give, to give us, to give you, to uh, give the public uh, even better data, uh, particularly as we think about um, equity, as, particularly as we think about dental care. Um, and so we have um, a proposal to add those enhancements to the all-payer claims database. The next proposal is our cultural communications proposal. This, um, through the COVID pandemic um, and some initial funding, again, from the feds, we are, were able to better invest in uh, meeting the language access needs um, of Minnesotans, particularly those for whom English, um, uh, who have limited English proficiency. We want to continue that work, and we are particularly also attuned uh, to um, to, again, in 
Minnesotans living with disabilities and making sure that the public health information that we have is accessible through American Sign Language and uh, computer assisted uh, technologies to, to assist to make sure everybody has the information they need to stay informed, to protect themselves, and to make good choices. And that information is provided in a culturally uh, relevant fashion to communities. Uh, below that, we have the telehealth and libraries pilot project. Um, librarians across the country right, are important community resources. They are trusted community resources. They have a strong orientation uh, to their communities and uh, through the pandemic have been um, across the country moving in spaces to, to better serve their communities. And uh, one of the spaces that libraries are excited about moving into is, is helping with telehealth, right? Telehealth, and we'll talk about our opportunity in a study to learn more about telehealth in this budget package, but you know, telehealth is is likely here to stay. People people like it. It it, it improves um, just anecdotally um, access. You know, I'm a, a clinician. I see people uh, using you know telehealth every visit. But some individuals struggle um, with accessing telehealth. Perhaps our elders. Perhaps. Um, folk who are not as computer um, um, savvy, um, this would provide in libraries not only a booth for people to go in to have a private uh, telehealth visit with their doctor, but also a health navigator to help folk log on, um, as well as to make sort of follow-up appointments. Um, this is particularly important in bridging the digital divide. Um, we've, uh, you will see in the governor's budget things about broadband access, so we know that there is a digital divide. And so for communities, particularly um, in greater Minnesota, who may not have the broadband in their homes, um, they can get it, you know, hopefully in their libraries, and libraries can apply for this grant program um, to help people log on and connect uh, with providers. Um, we have two other proposals to talk about in this package. Um, again, part of um, our reflections as an agency is both um, how we um, partner with communities, bringing that endpoint put uh, into our work, but also prepare ourselves as an organization um, to work well um, to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so this proposal really is striving to make us a diverse, equitable, inclusive, and an accessible workplace in which all employees feel that they belong or valued. Um, this is core and what we have seen pop up particularly in the last uh, several years is an increased emphasis in organizations across all types on uh, D, E, and I. Um, that really means nothing, right, if it's not backed up with some funding. And so this is what we hope to do with this proposal. Um, next, we have the homeless uh, mortality study, and, and there is an um, imminent report from our first um, homeless mortality a study uh, done, conducted in 2022. Um, you all know the importance of housing as a health determinant. Um, this report will talk about the, the really um, tragic outcomes for people who have experienced homelessness in terms of their mortality. This is work that we don't want to just have been a one-off uh, study, but we'd like to continue to work in that space. And so we are, are asking for additional funding um, to continue to look at uh, uh, mortality in uh, Minnesotans experiencing homelessness. So switching over to time critical prevention to address emerging or worsening health threats, uh, the goal of this bucket is really to sharpen our focus on specific issues that have been worsening before and during the pandemic or are uh, newly emerging. Um, and so we all know um, the statistics that we're seeing around, around mental health. You all are interacting with your constituencies and your family, friends, and neighbors. Mental health keeps rising up to the top of the list. Um, and there's a 988 suicide and crisis lifeline. And this proposal seeks to improve access and connection uh, to that critical resource. It's free, it's confidential, it's phone, it's text, it's chat uh, for anyone experiencing a mental health crisis. And so uh, this is a, a request to invest 
uh, more money in that uh, critical resource. Uh, the governor also has a uh, proposal, you know, as I was driving in this morning, um, you know, listening to the radio, there were again announcements of fatal overdoses um, due to opioids um, and due to sort of new substances um, that are increasingly uh, put into opioids um, more and more every day. And so um, to really address what is another sort of epidemic of drug overdoses and deaths, we have a multi-pronged strategy in this proposal that includes expanding access to non-narcotic uh, pain medication, includes um, providing uh, services and support to, again, through community hubs for resources to address opioid use um, among people experiencing homelessness, to really think about education um, and, and prevention, particularly for um, um, with community and particularly with pregnant women um, and pregnant people. Um, it's also to make sure and to support employers as we think about Minnesota economy and, and thriving workplaces, but to make, uh, to give the support to employers uh, to, to, to make sure that we have workplaces that are ready and sort of free of stigma uh, for people who have, who have suffered from addiction. Um, um, next, uh, in, in our bucket around time critical um, investments, again, back to mental health here, um, so we've already talked about the suicide line. I've, I've said a number of times sort of our value is to work in close partnership with communities and that communities often have the uh, solutions um, for things that are uh, would work um, for their mental health and well-being. And so these community mental health and well-being grants are, again, grants to fund community-based organizations and local health departments to develop and implement community-identified solutions for mental well-being. Um, then we have uh, below that a climate resiliency uh, a package. Um, we know that climate change is a contributor to new and emerging infectious disease, uh, whether they be zoonotic diseases like uh, COVID or, or vector-borne diseases, particularly from, from insects. Um, uh, but this would really give us the, the data analysis reporting uh, to implement, strengthen, evaluate, and track public health resiliency efforts in the face of climate change across the state, a critically important uh, goal in our uh, One Minnesota plan. And as we think about new and emerging diseases and as we think about not only preventing people from getting infected, we also have to think about, you know, treating folk once they become infected. And that means we have to protect our, our antibiotics, right, from, um, to make sure that they remain effective for all of these emerging diseases as, as viruses and, and bugs adapt to those. And so um, this is um, our uh, proposal to collaboratively come back antimicrobial resistance in terms of therapeutics, again, with, with partners uh, across the state in a collaborative. Although um, clearly um, we all here are, 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 are hoping that uh, COVID does um, fall away, um, we know that people in the course of the pandemic went with a lot of their preventative care services, and particularly those who have the most challenges to access to care services. And so the COVID delayed pre preventative care proposal really aims to support uh, folk to get back into, get back into care, um, to, to seek care for those conditions, um, and care that is culturally appropriate and tailored and to address the underlying barriers to preventative care. And while people delayed preventative care, while COVID, um, 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 one way that COVID is still with us, unfortunately, is through long COVID. Um, we know that many people are suffering from long COVID. It's going to be an ongoing um, COVID is going to be an ongoing source of uh, chronic disease and 
uh, we want to, to monitor its impacts um, and work with partners to do that and particularly monitor its social and economic impacts. And so this uh, proposal will provide us um, with funding not only to assist sort of the survivors of, of acute COVID illness who still cope with long COVID, uh, but to improve um, evidence-based strategies to address long COVID um, with collaboratives with the community, um, to give folk resources to individuals and communities, resources to cope with long COVID, um, and to continue to monitor the social and economic um, impacts um, of long COVID on people. Uh, the next proposal is our uh, Sentinel event reviews for police involved uh, deadly encounters. Um, this uh, proposal aims to examine um, actions and encounters occurring prior to police involved deaths. This is really all about uh, partnering with um, communities to avoid any preventable deaths by doing um, Sentinel event reviews. Uh, and our role is to give the data to work with partners. I think everybody, if a death is avoidable, we like to um, avoid it, um, particularly because deaths occurring during law enforcement encounters and service calls can have a significant impact on those involved and their families, their neighbors, and on relationships, of course, between the police and the community. And so we want accurate data analysis and public health tools to understand and lead to upstream solutions in that space. Um, we have a legalizing adult use cannabis uh, proposal um, that provides investments in prevention and consolidating regulatory uh, functions for adult use cannabis. Um, this is a proposal um, that uh, we are putting forth. Um, the good news about this proposal, there, there are several things that, that people are, are, are excited about this proposal. Within this proposal, we are definitely excited that as we move into this space of legalizing adult use cannabis, like on any other substances like alcohol, um, like tobacco, like prescription uh, pain medications that are substances, that there will be a regulatory framework wrapped around legalizing adult use, as well as monies for substance use uh, uh, prevention and education. Next, we will move into our Healthy Start proposals, which is about um, making sure that newborns and adolescents and their families have a healthy start to reduce health risks, build health resiliency, and improve their chances for success in life. So the Healthy Beginnings, Healthy Families proposal really supports the health of the youngest Minnesotans and their families, um, really by um, focusing with partners on infant mortality, increasing access to screening and services, improving perinatal outcomes and maternal substance use disorders, um, and expanding evidence-based family services for children of incarcerated parents in county jails. The next proposal is our Health Help Me Connect uh, proposal, which again is another resource uh, for families. Um, Help Me Connect is a website started through a grant program. Again, um, we want to continue that. It's, it's being accessed by over 11,000 visitors uh, each month. There are over 12,000 agency profiles um, in listed in the Help Me Connect system. So this is an important resources that people who are looking for help, again, Help Me Connect, can go to um, to find help for whatever they need for their, for their families. Um, so this investment will preserve the support needed to maintain that system and to improve it, um, including a, a toll-free number and an online chat feature. The next uh, two proposals are about first home visiting. Um, family home visiting is a voluntary preventive intervention um, that strengthens families in their communities. It has been shown to have powerful impacts on, on family and child outcomes. Um, and most of this money um, is con distributed to community health boards, tribal nations, and nonprofits being grant uh, programs. Um, so this proposal uh, will expand the family homes visiting program so that we can reach more families. 
Similarly, the family planning special projects, um, we had overwhelming demand for funding requests in this space. And this is, again, about providing comprehensive uh, counseling and education around uh, contraception, preconception -con pre care, screening and treatment for uh, sexually transmitted um, infections. We will continue to serve um, thousands of Minnesotans with this uh, program. And again, uh, this has seen overwhelming um, demand uh, recently for support. So we have um, included that again in our budget request. When we think about uh, early childhood development, another um, Another program that we have in place that really partners with communities is our Community uh, Solutions uh, Program, which really, again, focuses on um, here from pre prenatal to third grade, right? So the very earliest uh, start still, it really does focus on strategies that are rounds up from community uh, to really address disparities and make sure all kids um, have a healthy uh, start. Next, in the mental health space, we have a proposal about adolescent mental health um, promotion. Again, you all know, I, I've said it, you all know, I'll, I'll just say it again, that calls to address mental health are, um, are their urgent calls to address mental health. We have a student survey that uh, the Department of Health puts out, and in our last uh, survey where data was collected between January and June of 2022, 29% of students reported long-term mental health problems in that survey, um, and um, of the 11th graders, 28% um, seriously considered suicide at some point in their life. The numbers reporting experiencing long-term mental health crises or suicide are some of the highest that the survey has ever seen. And so we do think that is incredibly important to invest in adolescent mental health through this budget proposal um, that again creates um, additional funding for community-led supports to promote adolescent mental health um, skills. As we um, think about our young people, we also believe um, that school is often, um, it's a place where they are, um, you know, most of their day, um, and it's a place that can, can help support them if we can expand and further invest in our school health, in our school-based health centers. And so we have a proposal to also um, provide those investments in evidence-based models that both promote health equity equity and academic success, and again, will be a resource for our young people as they experience any sort of uh, health need, um, including what I was talking about in terms of uh, mental health in those school-based centers. Um, switching over to environmental uh, causes of disease, and, and particularly in our littlest Minnesotans, we know that lead, particularly lead exposure in early life, is uh, one source of um, adverse impact, particularly to uh, neurological development. Um, so we have two proposals on the lead service line uh, inventory. Um, this is really to, to find out right where those lines are um, in a um, robust way. It will, these grants will help community water systems meet the requirements for a lead service line inventory that is part of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's proposed lead and copper rule revision, as well as prepare these systems to apply for federal money to replace those service lines. Um, so this service line inventory is key and one of the first steps um, that we can take today to remediating and mitigating um, the impacts from um, lead. And then thinking about our child care centers, um, we have another grant specifically to help uh, child care centers um, identify um, lead risk. And so to do both uh, testing, so the proposal requires testing in child care settings, uh, makes that lead data available to the public, um, and creates a threshold for action uh, to play, take place when lead is found um, in drinking water. 
So really it helps our child care centers reduce uh, lead exposure to the kids that they are serving. Next, we're going to move into the bucket called healthcare access, affordability, and quality. Uh, the goal of these proposals are to improve access to and affordability and quality of our healthcare system for all Minnesotans. Um, the first proposal at the top of the list is really aimed to address um, the rising health care costs. Again, we saw the graphs the last time uh, we were here together. This will create a commission to really, um, again, with partners, uh, to, to look at the health care costs and really to think collaboratively um, about strategies to limit growth in spending. Um, we are particularly mindful of the impacts on rural communities and, and um, the commission will be uh, tasked with making sure that um, the, the recommendations that they can come up with do not uh, adversely, disproportionately at all impact rural communities. Um, but this is one way for us to wrap our heads around um, the drivers of health care costs and to start thinking together through this commission about the st additional strategies to reduce those costs. One of the things that we have been uh, doing in the space, as you know, in 2020, there was a prescription drug price transparency um, act that was really trying to get at the high cost that we all experience with uh, prescription drugs. Um, clearly, part of that cost are sort of at the end of manufacturers, and the data that we had um, um, looked at in that previous act was really focused on manufacturers, but we know manufacturers are not um, the only driver of costs, and so we need to look at other aspects of the supply chain, and so this actually helps us do that by looking at pharmacy benefit managers, by looking at wholesalers, by looking at those rebate uh, programs so that we can more comprehensively understand the drivers of prescription drug costs. Um, the next bucket is the uh, No Surprises Act enforcement. Um, clearly nobody wants to be caught with a high uh, medical bill that they weren't expecting. Um, federally, we, the No Surprises Act was, was passed. Um, this is to give us additional monies um, to make sure that that No Surprises Act um, can be um, properly enforced. Um, enforcement includes reviewing a health plan, facility and provider compliance, investigating Minnesotans' complaints, um, providing consumer education, and coordinating with our uh, federal counterparts in this effort. Um, there are also additional uh, protections um, for, for the uninsured and for self-pay patients. The next proposal is about revitalizing the healthcare workforce. Again, um, daily uh, in the news and in the press, um, and actually in our experience, if you go to try to get an appointment, we understand some of the uh, real shortages uh, for for individuals as patients and, and also for our health care facilities in terms of uh, providing the care that we need to Minnesotans. And so we really need to revitalize the health care workforce. And so um, this proposal focuses on strategies that include new and expanded clinical training opportunities, um, research on the status causes and distribution of workforce shortages, um, new programs to really improve provider mental health, and funding to develop uh, new provider recruitment tools. Next, we are, we are um, suggesting that we stop doing the chronic conditions spending report. It's not that we don't care about chronic conditions spending. We care a lot about that. But um, at this point, um, the, the department is an, unable with existing data and methodological challenges to produce reliable and meaningful annual estimates of chronic disease spending. So we, we would uh, we're requesting to uh, repeal the annual chronic conditions attribution report. Um, the next, sorry, um, the next one is repealing the women's right to know and positive alternative program. Um, of course, MDH recognizes the importance of supporting comprehensive and accurate reproductive information in healthcare, and in supporting families with young children. Um, repeal of this section will end a program that is duplicative of other work 
and uh, does not support that uh, aforementioned goal. We are requesting an operational adjustment to maintain um, our current uh, service levels. This is really to, to support the people um, that we have, to improve our technology, and to really continue the oversight and, and fiscal management and accountability that is important to the operation of any uh, state agency, and also to provide us with um, the technology if, um, that we need to be a strong public health um, agency. Next um, proposal focuses on assisted living licensure and home care. Um, this proposal um, does not increase any um, fees, uh, but it does assist us because we've had higher than anticipated uh, program demands in carrying out our regulatory uh, requirements in terms of overseeing um, the care of, of vulnerable adults. It increases uh, transparency for providers in terms of improving predictability of fines uh, by, um, by explicitly making um, the fine amounts uh, listed in statute as well, which is a, a technical change there. So next we're moving into uh, current service needs. So we need to make sure that MDH can meet statutory and program requirements as costs and demands increase. And so I will walk through uh, these uh, relatively uh, quickly. Uh, the first one is really to reinstate an advisory committee for, uh, for safe water, for safe drinking water and wastewater. There's no cost to reinstate uh, this council, um, uh, but um, it, it state, reinstates a council which expired um, in 2019. The next one is a trauma system fee adjustment. Um, and so we're going to this helps us ensure statewide uh, trauma care um, and, and increases uh, by a relatively uh, small amount hospital license fees. It aligns appropriations from the general fund and the state government special revenue fund for the work of designating trauma hospitals and again ensures effective statewide trauma system. To just give you a sense, the trauma system current fee is a $1,000 base fee. This will, will add an additional $12. Um, um, so in terms of the bed fee, there's an $1,826 base fee. This will add an additional $23. So um, relatively small additional dollars, but will help us ensure, again, that Minnesotans have access to high quality trauma care when they are in an emergency. The next one is an, another technical change that really um, just asks our, our local insurance officers of uh, birth and death certificates um, to send their surcharge funds to us on a um, monthly basis. And so it has no fiscal impacts, but it will clarify uh, for local offices uh, the requirements for monthly submissions, streamline the transfer and reporting of surcharges, and improve the timeliness of budget information. The next one is federal funds oversight and improves the oversight of our federal funds grants to community um, organizations, again, assisting MDH to be a better steward of um, the federal, that public resource. Next, as we um, think about um, the workforce, um, as a result of recent changes in state laws, more provider types are required to submit background studies on new hires. Sometimes this even happens for existing employees. Um, so to ensure that these background studies can be conducted in accordance with federal and state standards, we are asking for um, a, a background studies increase. I already mentioned telehealth, and there's a pr uh, proposal, again, to um, continue our telehealth uh, study budget change. Um, this study is really going to provide us uh, with the answers to telehealth in terms of how it affects access, quality, uh, the value of services, innovation and care delivery, and, and health equity. And so this uh, request is to shift a portion of the telehealth studying funding to fiscal year 2024 uh, to ensure completion of all these um, core analyses. 
Finally, um, we're going to talk about maintaining safe and healthy drinking water. The goal of this bucket is to make sure we protect and secure the state's drinking water. So the first proposal is to really um, strengthen public drinking water systems infrastructure. Um, whenever there's emergency, a crisis, a natural disaster, um, we, we want to make sure we have uninterrupted um, access to safe water for Minnesotans. And so this proposal ensures that um, through emergency power supplies and backup wells, backflow prevention, water reuse, cybersecurity, floodplain mapping, um, support for um, some water infrastructure and piloting solar farms in source water protection areas. So this is really about investing again in the infrastructure. Um, the next bucket is about um, really uh, making sure we're able to identify drinking water contaminants of emerging concern. This really will support um, our lab and build health guidance um, for PFAs, which as you know are um, PFAS are, are really um, widespread. Um, um, they don't uh, deteriorate. Um, they're around for a long time. They persist in the environment. And so this really helps us to uh, better identif identify uh, PFAS through testing capacity. The next proposal is about the future of drinking water and, and really is, is focused on, on thinking about through a multi-agency statewide uh, water plan, um, uh, the future and the, the planning and the strategic policy development really to protect Minnesota's um, water into the future and for future generations. Um, the next one is uh, groundwater restoration and uh, protection strategies, which are about provo really protecting local drinking water through technical support and data, um, and particularly focusing on our watersheds um, and developing a local comprehensive water plan. We have three more water proposals on, on this page, and this is our... Um, Next to last slide. So um, clearly private wells are also um, an area that we need to look into in terms of uh, sources for uh, water contaminants. And we want to make sure that within our private wells, we also have safe drinking water uh, for private well users. About 1.2 million people in Minnesota get their drinking water from a, from a private well. Um, and so we need to understand the occurrence and distribution of contaminants in those wells, make sure that people are educated, um, and we have outreach about well testing and mitigation, and we build capacity of partners to look into um, securing the safety of private wells. Um, the next one is recreational water quality. Um, online portal, which will increase transparency on beach water quality and safety when we recreate, right? We want to uh, live, work, and play safely. Um, so, and then the final one is source water protection, which is protecting Minnesota's sources of uh, drinking water through, um, and through an ongoing uh, wellhead protection plan development and implementation efforts. Um, so a number of proposals really uh, true to address the safety of our water systems. And the very last slide is a uh, basic overview slide of what the dollars uh, look like when we sum up across all of these um, proposals. And so just walking you all uh, through this line overall across all uh, across all funds, which is really the bottom the bottom row there, the gray row, um, there's a $393 million um, increased rev resources for MDH. Of course, MDH has a wide ranging input, as you can tell from our proposals, in terms of strategies to protect our health. Of course, as we've talked about, again, we often go from uh, panic to neglect. This is an opportunity for us to not uh, do that, uh, to really help us be a comprehensive agency that can address uh, the public health for all Minnesotans. 
And so of that 393, uh, 310 million are, are coming from the general fund, uh, 50 mi 59 uh, million dollars are one time and the first biennium. And so this is a just summary slide uh, for your review. Thank you for your time and attention as I walk through all of those proposals. Um, I really would uh, appreciate any sort of dialogue and, and questions from the committee. We are quite excited about uh, the governor's budget and how it will invest in public health, um, really help us partner more effectively with communities to, to develop solutions, make some important technical fixes um, that help us get uh, better data um, to, to perform our oversights of, of funds more, um, and also really look at our water supply when we think about um, climate change and we think about safety and we think about the water for all of our, for all of our health um, and for many communities, um, in particular their spiritual well-being. So thank you all so much for this time. Again, I have my team here and we are happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, the Department of Health has a responsibility for such diverse and important areas that relate to our lives, and I really appreciate your going through the proposals and um, excited about um, the different aspects of the, of the governor's budget proposals. Members, do you have any questions? Um, Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. A um, couple questions. Uh, I saw, I have a lot of questions, but I'll wait. These, I'm sure, are all going to come back in committee at some point and some bills, and we'll have um, further conversations. But uh, one comment I saw here, and we've, you know, this is just my seventh year, but I, it comes through every year, and we funded it, I believe, a number of times, and it was the lead inventory. That's just one that jumped out at me. Um, that, But we can do those type of things when they come up again. But um, what we see the total spend um, in the increased spending, what part of it is new programming um, versus just increased of uh, ongoing programming? And then the other thing, you know, page by page I could see the new FTEs that are included, but we don't have a grand total. Could you give us the grand total of this included in this full budget proposal? Commissioner Cunningham. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Wicklin, um, members of the committee. Um, I don't. I don't currently have with me the number of new programs or the total number of um, new FTEs, but I am sure that we could get those uh, for the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we would. We'd appreciate that breakdown. Um, Senator Atkey, did you have other questions? Um, no, Madam Chair. I, like I said, I have, I have questions, but uh, I'm sure we'll have discussions as bills come forward with these various pieces in them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Abler. Thanks again. And um, I do have a, a number of questions. And I, again, I could use the rest of the time, but I'm not doing that. So just a few minutes on some comments. It looks like you're spending $727 million over four years for some programs. And, you know, a lot of them are, you know, I would call essential, you sat through the last hearing. Um, when you sit in that chair, it's different than when you sit in this chair. So I'm really an advisor at this point to what the bill might be. And so, um, but so, because uh, we, when you sit in that chair, you get to write a bill and then people react to it and so their priorities. And I think you've spelled out your priorities pretty clearly and I appreciate a, a number of them. And I am curious how many FTEs are added because I, in the human, in the human services one, they had 1,200. And I just want to remind, members and the public that there's only about 6,000 human beings to work in the increased workforce. And so, like the cannabis one took 100, you know, as an example. And anyway, um, and there's $47 million, or $82 million in fees over the four years, looks like to me. And so, um, to the department, as you triage those, what are really important ones, and Madam Chair, as you decide what we're gonna burden these providers and operators with, um, that's, that's not a, a small number. Um, I like the clean water stuff, and I think lead's important, and we argue sometimes, but I, you, you just don't get over lead. So, I mean, it's, if you get it in your head as a child, you get to keep it, and it causes a lot of trouble. Um, and um, 
So I think I'm going to stick with my highest of highlights. Um, in the cannabis program, which I have great concerns about, I don't think it's a casual thing to do. It's uh, brought in here like it's some great little thing, and it's going to be like no big deal, and there's a little bit of training. There's some money for training youth not to do it. Um, and the doctors I talk to say that the synapses uh, can be screwed up until the person is 25, and we're going to have a 21 thing. And, and they said, oh, so that goes away? No, it doesn't go away. Oh, great. Um, so, um, you know, as, as with the gummies, which are getting in the hands of youth, um, there's going to be ninth graders smoking pot and probably sixth graders smoking pot that's much stronger than when I was in college. Um, and uh, I have a history of uh, abuse of that and I'm not afraid to talk about it, and it didn't make my life any better. I can't imagine what the current potency would have done to the crew I hung with. Um, and so I'm just very, very concerned about that. And so, um, Commissioner, I looked through the whole list of all the stuff there, and, and so um, there's like programming for education and so on, and there's a, let me turn to that page. Um, and so, uh, you know, you know, you're gonna. <laughs> there's a talking about, um, you know, state police and arrests they're gonna make, and there's a whole issue with arresting people in a racially biased way, which I think is horrible. I carry the bill to decriminalize it, and I think that it's, it's ridiculous to be arresting anybody for the small amounts that we are. Two ounces is like a two hundred dollar fine or something. Um, but going from that level, and to do it correctly and not in a targeted, unfair way, to go to legalization where it's just going to be the cool thing to do and it's no big deal, let's follow the states, and the governor's like, oh yeah, this is going to be amazing uh, with the libertarian youth, um, I'm really worried about it. Um, and, um, and I don't think it's going to replace the illicit market at all. I think it's going to create two markets, and uh, I think we need to limit the potency at least. Uh, but there's going to be a market that's going to sideswipe the regular market, which is done in every state where they don't pay the tax. It's maybe better stuff or unknown stuff. And, but it's going to reduce the concern people have about that. And so I bring that up because it's in your report here. But so the question I have on this part is how much are you spending on treatment on the people that, that fall over the cliff? and abuse it. Is that in this list here or is that in another proposal somewhere? Commissioner Cunningham. Chair Wicklin, uh, thank you very, very much. Our, our budget for um, the, the, the cannabis, the adult use cannabis folk program really focuses on the prevention side. Um, uh, Chair Wicklin, we think that uh, prevention and really educating people who may only perceive the, the positive aspects of any substance use, it's really important that we uh, do that education to make them aware of the potential adverse health effects as well. So, so the, the piece that MDH um, is really focused on is the prevention, the education. I don't have the dollar amounts here today in terms of what amount of that falls in, into um, the overall adult use cannabis program, we can come back uh, with that. And also just being a partner uh, with um, you all, with other others as we develop that regulatory framework. Uh, because again, as I was stating, there are other substances um, that, that the public uses in terms of alcohol, um, in terms of tobacco, and they exist in a legal way in part because of that uh, regulatory uh, framework. And so in we are really focused again on thinking about the prevention, the education, and partnering with folks as they come up with that regulatory framework. Thanks, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Thanks, Madam Chair and Commissioner, and I appreciate that, but I, 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 that was not the answer I expected. Uh, I thought you were going to say, oh yeah, there's $30 million put aside because you're going to have more clients in the substance use programs. I promise you. Um, no treatment um, professional I've met at, at, in my current role and the former role, I, I talked to dozens of people who do substance use treatment, and none of them are excited about this. They're worried, and uh, plenty of business for them. But I, would you please tell the governor that he had 
darn well, um, <laughs> it's going to be abused. And people are going to come to harm, and some of the very targeted equity populations you're worried about are going to be with some of the ones more at risk. And they are not going to recover. They're not going to be able to achieve the benefits that uh, we want on this. So I, I don't mean to go off on that, but, I, but that's, you can respond, Commissioner, if you want, or just... Commissioner Cunningham. So thank you, Chair Wicklin, uh, Senator. Um, in terms of your, in terms of the concern um, about the uh, downstream impacts on on health, I know within the DHS budget, in terms of um, thinking about what we might see in terms of um, mitigating uh, substance use uh, for for all substances, that they are they are actively uh, focused on substance use treatment as well. Thanks. Senator Abler, and, and I think yeah, the, gonna, the bill that the bill that's moving in the Senate, you know, will come to this committee, and you'll have right. a chance to talk about you know how how that bill author is incorporated response right. to these questions as well. Well, thanks, and I but I think I'm on topic. I mean, it's in the book. It's a whole series of pages, and oh, you know, I, yeah, Senator Abler, I'm not indicating yeah. that you're off topic. I'm just yeah. saying that the the comprehensiveness of yeah. a response um, is beyond what the Department of Health is going to be able to provide. So. Sure. And so, uh, but anyway, just, Commissioner, you're, we had a great chat yesterday. I appreciate it. I, I really like where your head's going, and I'm glad you're there. Um, this is a gap. And you heard my comments about spending the money. Like, okay, we're going to spend the money. We're going to spend way more money than I probably would ever consider spending on some of these things. But if you're going to spend the money, you better buy some of this. You better buy some treatment uh, because you, know, you better plan for it. And the governor, frankly, should tone down his rhetoric about his enthusiasm for this getting legalized because the kids are hearing that. I can't wait to get it. And there's a concern about the gummies, which was a whole other discussion we're not going to have today, um, getting in the hands of uh, middle school kids, which wasn't the plan. So I'm just, anyway. So, uh, Madam Chair, I've, uh, there's one other thing I have to bring up, and uh, I'm actually... I have more questions here than I'm going to ask, except for this other one. And uh, Commissioner, we spoke about this, and it's the Positive Alternatives uh, Program. Um, and I read the text there, and um, I just want to tell you that this has been one of the bright spots in the abortion debate where people actually could agree that abortion should be more rare. And the, the criticism from the side of the people who uh, favor abortion is like, well, and you know, after these people, who's going to help them through the process? Who's going to watch them afterwards? Positive Alternatives does that. And it does that to carry people from the beginning through the end by encouragement. And so, because I don't think anybody wants more abortions. I don't think anybody thinks that abortions are better than childbirth. And so to eliminate this program, it's, in my mind, wrongheaded. And as we chatted yesterday, it is deeply offensive to me. It's been in operation since 2005. There are, I don't know how many operations there are across the state, but they're highly successful. They do their job. People are very happy with it. And it's, it's just not necessary to take this shot at people who are convinced that life really begins earlier and we shouldn't be taking it. Um, in the middle of all the other discussions being led from the top at the governor's office, we had two bills on abortions, and I'm not going to relitigate that, but this is the wrong thing to do. It doesn't show good faith. It's, it's not a slap in the face. It's a stab in the heart at people who are trying to do the right thing and to make a difference. And so if you want to take that back to your boss, I would be grateful. And Madam Chair, please don't put that in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I, Commissioner, did you have any Thing you wanted to say in response. It wasn't uh, really a question, but. Uh, thank you, Chair Wicklin. Uh, I, I, I'm listening to you, uh, your comment. I, I hear your comment, uh, the Senator's comment, uh, Chair Wicklin. Um, and, and again, my team is here also listening. So I so appreciate the comment. Okay, thank you. Um, others, other members with questions? Um, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here again, and I want to congratulate you and the administration. There's so much good in this plan. Um, I have just I have a 
couple of short comments and then one question. I was really glad to see the drug price transparency extended to include PBMs and wholesalers. We've got to get a better handle on why the cost of prescription drugs is so out of control and their important pieces on that supply chain. Um, also glad to see that the telehealth study is being extended. I'd even suggest extending it one more year so that we can get really good, fulsome data about um, assessing its effectiveness in terms of meeting uh, the stated quality, value, and equity goals um, of it. Um, and then I'm very excited about the statewide drinking water plan. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you could, I don't know how far along it is, but I'd want, I wonder if you could be a little more, um, uh, just speak in a little bit more detail about what's going to be assessed. You know, are, are things like some of our agricultural practices going to be included in that conversation? Uh, will there be um, any assessment of, you know, this conversation we're having in Minnesota about taking the risk of embarking on this copper sulfide mining that we've never done in our state before, known as the most toxic industry in America um, with direct impacts on water. Um, just wondering if you could speak to that at all. Commissioner Cunningham. Thank you, Chair Wickland, members of the committee. I perhaps will turn over to my environmental health uh, team and ask if they could elaborate here on the clean water proposals. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please um, introduce yourself um, and begin to answer the question. Good morning, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. I'm Dan Huff, and I am the Assistant Commissioner um, for Health Protection uh, with MDH. And I am joined here uh, with my colleague, uh, Sandeep Berman, who is the manager of our drinking water uh, program here at MDH. Thank you. Did you um, did you want um, Senator Morrison? Did you have want to repeat your your specific question about the? Thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you for for joining the conversation. My question is about the statewide drinking water um, plan, which I'm very excited about. I think it's really important. When here we are in this moment of accelerating climate change, increasing water scarcity, we sit on this wealth of fresh water in Minnesota. I believe we have to be very planful, careful stewards of it going forward. And I'm wondering if this plan will, how comprehensive it is, will it take into account things like some of our agricultural practices? Will it look at this risk that we're had talking about taking in Minnesota of embarking on hard rock copper sulfide mining, um, which is known as the most toxic industry in America and has direct impacts on water? I'm wondering if those things are going to be part of this plan. Mr. Huff? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, <clears throat> I would say that it is part of a, an entire comprehensive package looking at many different impacts to uh, our water resources and our drinking water. I would also point to some of the companion pieces. So our, uh, our well protection uh, proposal, because 20% of Minnesotans drink water from private wells, which are uh, not under regulatory requirement or, or um, regularly monitored. Um, our uh, groundwater uh, area protection strategies proposal, which gives uh, a local funding for local conservation districts and others um, to really develop uh, groundwater um, analysis and protection plans as part of the um, one, plan, one watershed, one plan approach that's administered by the Border Water Soil Resources. Um, so this is uh, the, the state drinking water plan is part of a comprehensive package to do just what you're saying. Um, now, will it cover all of those areas? Um, I would need to confer with our, our team. Um, part of what we're, uh, this, this plan is based upon is work done by the University of Minnesota where they've really outlined these are the goals that we should achieve with the plan, and we can provide more detail in a follow-up for you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Th thank you for that answer, and I would just encourage the department to, to consider those factors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, other members? Oh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. I was, I was listening in 
for some reason, I'm, we're busy. It's like, but I, I wanted to make sure I was down here so we could have this conversation. And a couple of points. Um, when you look at the national performance measures that are put together by the Maternal Child Health Bureau, right? Minnesota has to do a five-year needs assessment. The last one that was done was 2020. And embedded within all those um, interactions, you know, you, uh, we as a state came up with 11 priorities, right? And, and I'm not gonna quiz you on those 11 priorities, but one of them happens to be on the, on the suicide, um, adolescent suicide and, and pieces. And, but embedded in the national performance measures is also the discussion of mental health and substance use collaboratively, right? And, and so when I hear the, the proposal come out and we hear prevention side education and partnership, it gets away from the aspect of the three things that matter within um, a recovery, addiction, suicide, is that's prevention, treatment, and recovery, those three things, PR, um, PTR, right, when, when, you, when you look at that. And so there's an opportunity here, Commissioner, because you have that same um, process going in education when they're talking about prevention, treatment, and recovery, the youth that are, and anecdotally, you hear the stories of an eight-year-old that has an, you know, an opioid uh, overdose in, in the western part of the state, right? And you just think, well, why is that happening? Or you hear the school boards association and the school board members are saying, you know, we're, we're absolutely needing some help when it comes to mental health and substance. They're using those two in the same construct conversation. So, Commissioner, I would, I would say, look backing at your priority areas, the 11 priority areas that the state of Minnesota did based on the 2020 needs assessment. I don't know why I know this. Yeah, I know why. But the fact is, I think there's an opportunity for you to reach across to the Department of Education because they're absolutely showing the same needs in, in through that. And, and instead of seeing this as a health vision, this is education division, and, and hence your statement of partnership. But I, I challenge, I would challenge our agencies to go beyond just partnerships, right? Um, and, and really look at what the McKnight model or even the Franz model says. You look at true integration and you just black down, you know, block down those, those barriers that just don't exist anymore if you truly look at, at, at uh, true integration, right? Um, so I, I, I like to see what you have in here, right? And I just, I wanna throw that challenge at you and, and advocate that you go beyond that. Cause it, I'm not reading it here. And when I look at the national performance measures and I'm not seeing how they're interacting in that piece. Am I making sense to you, Commissioner, on that? Commissioner Cunningham. Chair Wicklin, uh, Senator, thank you. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate that challenge that you put out to, to the agency, Senator. Um, and, and, and Chair Wicklin, I, I, will, I will go back and look at, right, the, the national uh, performance measures in, in the space. I will say it at MDH, um, we emphasize partnership just because of what's in our main circle of control versus what's in our circle of, of, of influence. And so we must work with partners like um, MDE, like DHS, right? So as we focus really deeply um, in, in prevention and prevention at, at both ends, right? Prevention before, um, when we talk about substance use before, um, to, to mitigate people initiating the use of, of substances, but also prevention of death, right? Um, um, and harm reduction so that people um, who have initiated a substance use or and are, um, have a disease of addiction um, don't have the most, the, the worst outcomes, right? A, a, a fatality. And so we really do uh, drill really down into the prevention space and care a lot about treatment and recovery and care a lot uh, that people have access and care a lot that we think with partners about how we mitigate those barriers uh, to treatment and recovery. And so, um, so I appreciate uh, the Senator's comments. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, as a uh, follow-up. Senator Hoffman. So thank you for that and, and, and to, to highlight that, I think one of the things you have at your um, ready is the Maternal Child Health Advisory yeah. panel that I think it's 15, still 15 members maybe, um, that, that are made up across section of, of folks in there too. So I appreciate your comments and appreciate your work. Thank you. Commissioner Cunningham, did any other? Chair Wicklin, I don't have a comment. I okay. appreciate that, Senator. All right, thank you. 
Any other member questions? Well, I look, I look forward to um, exploring the proposals in greater detail. I, I appreciate seeing so many um, proposals that relate to you know, a healthy start for our kids. And um, I also appreciate that seeing that um, you have strong healthcare access affordability proposals. And I, I look forward to looking into those as well as the other, other areas as well. So we'll have, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk more about uh, many of these over the next few weeks. So thank you again for coming and presenting to my committee. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Look forward to the ongoing conversations. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll move to our, our last item of business on the agenda is to take up Senate File 71. Senator May Quaid is here to present her bill. And if you'd like to have your testifiers come up, oh, I see they're here as well. And Senator May Quaid, I believe you have an author's amendment. Yes, the, I do. The A1. Yes. And that, members, is in your packets. Um, I don't know if you have a comment about the author's amendment. Or um, not. Thank you, Madam Chair. The author's amendment was suggested as just the way that the Senate does um, bills like this. So it just gets it into official order. It doesn't change anything about the bill. OK, thank you. Uh, members, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator McQuaid, would you thank like you, to present your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, members of the committee. Uh, this is a short but very, very important bill. Um, food shelf visits across Minnesota are up more than any year on record. And this is due in large part to the rapid rise of uh, the cost of food and the loss of pandemic relief programs, which are you know, slowly um, coming to a close. And the surge in demand is putting a lot of pressure on food shelves. And in some cases, food shelves are having to limit the food that they're giving out. They're definitely seeing folks that they have never seen before. And so we know that there's a f emergency funding that's needed to help with this huge increase. So Senate File 1 uh, will help sh keep shelves stocked with food during this difficult time. Time. And um, the statistics are quite alarming. And I think food shelves are, um, you know, approaching the point at which we really need to step in. And this isn't like a, a May type timeline. We're talking like in the next month or two type timeline. And I'm going to let my testifiers talk a little bit more about the need and what's going on. I'll pass it to Colleen first. Thank you. Um, and I show Colleen Moriarty. Would you like to go first? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. We surely are in an emergency I'm, I'm situation. Sorry, uh, please state your name for the record. I'm and sorry. Then you can begin Colleen Moriarty. Thank you. And I'm the executive director at Hunger Solutions Minnesota. We surely are in, uh, in terms in a crisis situation. Um, in, uh, we've seen a rise of 61% in the last year of uses at food shelves. That brings us up 2 million visits in the last year. We are at almost 6 million visits a year. They're really, as the pandemic uh, programs peeled off, people had one alternative, and that was a visit to a food shelf. Coupled with the fact that the cost of food and the cost of everything that's in the food shelf is much higher, like it is for all of us when we go to the grocery store. But we've found that in child visits, adult visits, senior visits, all of them are up double digits. Um, in counties around the state, um, we've seen uh, in Anoka County a 232% increase. In um, Washington County, a 248% increase, a 307% increase in Faribault County. We really, they really need assistance now. They need to have more food on the shelves. They need to be able to have access to more food. And they need the money to be able to afford their um, rent, their utilities, and other um, important items. You know, I've been um, in my position for 18 years. 
And I've never seen this kind of demand at the food shelves. And we're readying ourselves for the emergency uh, SNAP benefits to roll off now in, um, in March. And, we, and uh, as I am a part of conversations nationally with other organizations about what that's going to mean to them, there's one piece of advice that they unilaterally give. Just tell people to go to the pantry or the food shelf. There, you know, if we can hardly keep up now and we have this looming pressure in front of us, we need your assistance. We need to be able to help people have access to the kind of, of food that they need to keep going. So I, um, I really implore you to um, support this and I really appreciate the fact that um, Senator McQuaid has been a warrior for child nutrition programs for as long as I've known her and I've had the pleasure of working with her. And I really appreciate your support, and I really um, think that this is one time that we can band together across the aisles and say, we're, we need to support the people of Minnesota who need our help with food. Thank you, and now I show Dom Corbell, mm -hmm. and please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. You bet. Uh, Madam Chair, committee, thanks for uh, having me here today and thanks for being invited and thank you to the Senator for putting this bill forth. So my name is Dom Corbel. I'm the Executive Director of Community Pathways of Steele County in the great city of Owatonna. Got a beautiful drive up here today, so it's fantastic to be here. We are a nonprofit that has two sides to it. One's a thrift store, the other is the traditional food shelf. And in 2022, we actually doubled the space of our food shelf, both shopping and storage, as part of a successful 2021 capital campaign. We did that expansion with the plan of being ready for the future. What we didn't know at the time was the future would be right now. Let me give you some data to help you see what we're seeing in Owatonna. A couple key points. Here's a big one. In 2021, we averaged 254 families shopping a week. Our current six week rolling average is 532 families shopping a week, more than double. And I believe this week we will set a one week record. I think we're gonna break 600 for the first time. So that 532 is going to continue to climb. In 2021 in Steele County, we served 1183 families at least one time, providing them food. Of them, 225 were first-time shoppers. In 2022, we served 1,870 families at least one time. And of them, an astonishing 776 of them were first-time shoppers. As Colleen said, the, the need is escalating right in front of us. We were able to meet the need, but only by doing so, by spending down our reserves we had to spend double our food budget to meet that need. So we got coupled with increasing costs and over double our visits. Sadly, we're not alone. This is a story of every food shelf across the state of Minnesota right now. Any one of my peers could have been brought here today to tell you those exact same, basically mirrored statistics, if you will. And here's the deal, what we're experiencing with food insecurity right now is not a metro challenge or an Owatonna challenge. It is a Minnesota challenge that requires Minnesota partnerships and Minnesota solutions. SF-71, the bill before you to get emergency funding to us is one of those solutions. And there are many layers to food insecurity and we all know that, but we are in a critical stage. Our budgets can't withstand another year of this type of increase without some support. And so that's the ask. The ask is to look across this room, and when I say Minnesota Solutions, this committee is part of that, of course. That's your job. And so we're reaching out saying, support this bill, help us meet this demand in the short term while we can work on the longer term solutions that I know you'll all hear about as well as part of the larger budget. But today it's about immediate need to get us over the hump. Thanks for having me today. And uh, you know what? We need you because we're hashtag stronger together. Let's do it. Thank you. Um, thank you both for testifying. It's um, really important to be able to hear from you know people who are experiencing um, these needs across the state. And so, thank you for coming up. Members, do you have any questions, Senator Utke? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a question, just for clarification. This money comes through DHS. Um, I'm surprised that 
we need an emergency bill for $5 million. Wouldn't they have money to do that already? Um, I don't know. Can somebody clarify that? Uh, uh, Madam Martin Chair, Eddie? members of the committee, Senator, there is currently in the biennium uh, $3.2 million allotted for food shelves in the state of Minnesota. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on this DHS budget, but I know that that money um, has We've already allocated that money, and this is an extraordinary time. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, yeah, I, I, I hear you. So that the 3.2 then has been appropriate or have been used. Um, we know DHS has got a sizable pool of money <laughs> that they're sitting on that hasn't been spent yet this year. So um, with that, um, this was just more of a comment. I noticed that the, the the commissioner must expedite. I would think something like this, it's an emergency, would have been <laughs> it'd be the assumed way they would approach this. But anyhow, the, the question I do have is, how do you distribute this money so that it's equal across the state? You know, we get a representative here from Steele County, so an outstate county. Um, I have a lot of rural counties in my area. Do, is there a plan so that everybody gets a fair shot? Is, is, it, is it a grant or an application process, or you, is it an automatic distribution just based on populations and such? Thank you. Ms. Moriarty, did you wish to answer? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senator, the, we have been distributing food shelf money for over 20 years with the state of Minnesota, and um, the, the statistics are turned in every month. We, ha we keep an accurate um, statistics on everyone visiting food shelves in the state of Minnesota for TFAP food shelves. And those are f food shelves that receive commodities from the federal government where people self-attest their income level and their eligibility. Um, so the figures and the data is then scrutinized both by us and DHS, and the allocations are made on the numbers of people who have visited your food shelf. In other words, you're eligible for more funding if you have more of a need, um, but they are updated every month, and that's how we know that we will top, or we will be very close to six million visits because we work with the state to track that. Any other questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple. I've, I um, I, I want to just uh, clarify the, to Senator Rucky's point. Um, in Minnesota, I wish that money was sitting in DHS, Senator Rutke, but unfortunately, the way Minnesota rolls it out, the $1.825 billion of the surplus was money that should have been spent in human services. So just imagine if we could redirect that money that, would have, that is now sitting in, in the surplus. If we could have had an avenue to redirect that, Senator Mayquay, this urgency, this needed bill, wouldn't have to be coming in front of us to do it. Rather, we could have put priorities in place that would have said, oh, geez, this makes sense, right? So thank you for bringing this bill. And so um, to that point, it would be nice if we could redirect some funds that should have been spent back into the bucket where it belongs. So just to highlight people, I'd like to see that maybe. But Senator Wicklund, Madam Chair, this bill, um, I'm, I'm hearing the urgency, the fact that SNAP's rolling off in March. You're not going to just lay this over. Do you plan on sending this to finance and go right to the floor so we can um, take the money out of the surplus that should have been spent in this bucket? Senator Hoffman, yeah, the bill will be re, will be referred to the Finance Committee, and yes, I mean that's the the reason we're hearing it today is that it is seen as an urgency and is being moved in the other body, and um, so we're we're hoping that we can um, see action taken as quickly as possible. So, can we move this bill right now? I mean, is that something? You Senator like Hoffman, do? we can move this bill right now. <laughs> um, Senator Mayquaid, did you have any other comments before? Um, Madam Chair, no, thank you so much to the committee for hearing this, and I think you do understand the, the urgency and the need, so I, I appreciate the expeditious um, action. Um, and if Senator Hoffman, you could move Senator Mayquaid's bill, um, Senate 71, so one, Madam Chair. as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance. Is that your motion? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does pass uh, or prevail, and the bill is passed and moved to referred to the Committee on Finance. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And that concludes our, our um, agenda for today. And the meet, uh, committee is adjourned.